again. This is Candace Salima with Turning the Tide, coming at you from the heart of the Rocky Mountains. Today, I am so thrilled to say we are going to be interviewing New York Times bestselling author Steve Barry. And I want to read you his bio because his assistant sent it to me, actually his agent, and it is a fabulous bio. So I wanted to share it because it's very inspiring. And I think it is something everyone should hear. If Ian Fleming and Doris Kearns Goodwin had a love child, it would be Steve Barry, the best-selling author of The Emperor's Tomb, The Paris Vendetta, The Charlemagne Pursuit, The Venetian Betrayal, The Alexandra Link, The Templar Legacy, The Third Secret, The Romanoff Prophecy, and The Amber Room. A fixture on the New York Times bestseller list, Barry has been translated into 39 languages and has sold more than 12 million books in 50 countries worldwide. Steve Barry was raised in Georgia and graduated from Walter F. Georgia School of Law at Mercer University. He wrote his first book as a practicing attorney, a process that took him 12 years, 5 editions, and 85 rejections. Yes, you heard me, 85 rejections, before he sold his first manuscript. He credits the nuns who taught him in Catholic school with instilling the discipline needed to create a novel and to find a publisher. A lifelong devoted student of history, Barry is dedicated to researching his novels in depth. He and his wife Elizabeth founded History Matters in 2010. It is a nonprofit organization dedicated to aiding the preservation of the fragile reminders of our nation's heritage. Since then, they have traveled the country raising much-needed funds for a wide range of historic preservation projects. Barry is also extremely active in the writing community and is the outgoing president of the International Thriller Writers and one of its founding members. Steve, welcome to Turning the Tide. I am so grateful you found the time to join us today. I know you are busy writing, and, and thank you. Welcome. It's great to be here. Let's talk a little bit about this foundation before we dive into your book, The Jefferson Key. Um, you call it History Matters, if I, if I caught that right. Yeah, I did. Okay, so History Matters. What is that all about? Well, Elizabeth and I, when we were traveling around the country doing promotion for the books, we kept noticing that there's just no more money out there anymore for historic preservation. There's nothing there. I mean, I was a county commissioner. I served 10 years as a county commissioner in Camden County, and and we had no money for historic preservation. It was just one of those things you could not afford to do. So we came up with History Matters as a way to try to help out with uh, 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 trying to preserve certain things. We do it in a very unique way. An example would be what we just did. We just did one up in uh, Illinois, in in, uh, southern Illinois, in mid uh, central Illinois, uh, for the Lincoln Log Cabin up there. They need some money for some projects they wanted to do in restoration on the cabin. So we did a writer's workshop that we did up there at the uh, uh, Southern Illinois University. We did a, uh, a workshop there. You bought your way in with a contribution of about 80 something dollars, $85, I think it was. We had about 50 people there that day. We raised around $4,000, and that money goes all, all to, the, to the project. And what I do... Uh, when the workshop is I teach a four-hour course on writing, a very intense four-hour course on the craft of writing. And all the – very, very much, though, we talk about, about point of view and story structure and characters and all these types of things. It's a very good uh, course for, for writers. It gets them a good overview of what they need to be dealing with. And, and all the money raised goes to the project. I don't charge to come. I don't charge any expenses or anything like that. It all goes. And so far, we've done about 11 of these. We've raised somewhere around $80,000 and dealt with a little over 1,000 uh, people. Wow. So, uh, so it works uh, very well. We've got um, one coming up uh, here very shortly up in uh, uh, Connecticut that will, spot, well, will benefit the, the uh, Mark Twain house. I'll be up there uh, in early November. It will be... Uh, I was going to get you the exact date, would be uh, uh, November 5th uh, from 9 to 1. I'm going to be teaching one in Hartford, Connecticut, and it will, will uh, for the Connecticut Historical Society is what's going to benefit them. Uh, and uh, anybody up in that area uh, can go to my website, steveberry.org, and click on the event section, and they'll see the event, and they can register and come. Any writers out there, it's a great four hours, and all the money's going to go, as I said, to the Connecticut Historical Society. That is wonderful, and it's to preserve uh, a Mark Twain cabin. Is that what I heard well, you say? Well, I, I thought I, I was I was I, I was confused between two events. There's another oh. event. There's another event that night at six thirty at the Mark Twain House that Got I'm doing it. a History Matters gala that will benefit the Mark Twain House, and that's a 
separate event. So those of you all in that area who are not riders would love to come to that event that night. That's going to benefit the Mark Twain House. Then that morning from 9 to 1, I'm going to be doing the workshop to benefit the Connecticut Historical Society there at Hartford. So that's the last one we have this year, and we have about six planned next year. Oh, my goodness. Steve, we're going to have to get you out to Utah. I know when we interviewed you when I was on Buy Back America, we talked about it, but I'm really going to be proactive about it. We Here in Utah, you cannot throw a rock and not hit an author. <laughs> well, we are we are actually looking to do a History Matters event there next May in really? Salt Lake City. Yeah, in Salt Lake City. Uh, I'm gonna, Salt Lake City is going to be part of the tour for the new book next May when I go out, and we're looking. We're talking to your the uh, Salt Lake City historical people right now about doing an event out in that area. Oh my goodness, Steve! When you come, I will come to where you're doing your thing. Number one, I'll sign up for the workshop because I'm a writer too, but. Um, I will come to where you're doing your thing and interview you there. Uh, we'll, maybe we we'll, can. We will keep in touch and, and do it because we're definitely talking to them right now. Because Salt Lake City is going to be on the uh, on the tour, and we wanted to do a history matters event while we were there in town. Okay, let me ask you then: Is your next book got some Salt Lake scenery in it? Uh, not that book, but the book after will be. Ooh. So I'm, I'll, I'll actually be doing some research while I'm there for the book that I'll be writing for that'll be published in 2000. And uh, fourteen. Oh my goodness! Yeah, yeah. So I'll be. That's next. That's next May. Now it's May of 2012 when I'll be there. I'll, I'll be just finishing up writing the 2013 book. You stay a year ahead in the book business. Right. So, so I'll actually be uh, planning and plotting 14, and I'm going to be doing some research while I'm there. Okay. Well, and you said that is with the Salt Lake Historical Society. Is that what I heard? I believe. That that's who they're talking with, uh, uh, Esther, who uh, heads up my foundation and does it, mention it to me, that she's been in contact with some folks out there in Salt Lake City, and they're talking about uh, seeing what we can do with the History Matters event there next May. Oh, wow. I will get a hold of Esther if I can, and uh, I will set up some interviews with the Salt Lake Historical Society leading up to that event so we can get as many people there as possible. Sure. We'll, we'll, we'll be. I've got your contacts, so we'll definitely... Uh, put you we'll be in touch with you as soon as we firm something up with them. absolutely let me help in any way i can because i love history and i love literature and you're combining two of my favorite things there <laughs> I, I think it'd be very good i've never been to utah so it's going to be my first trip there oh steve we have to make sure you've got a guide that can show you how amazing this place is and and if i need to take you and your wife around myself i will because it is forward. yeah it's amazing you will love it here we have about every type of uh, geography here and and the most stunning, beautiful scenery in the world, plus some amazing historical sites. So you just can't go wrong. Yeah, that's what I'm going to take a look at because I said the 2014 book will, will deal with uh, that area of the country, yes. Well, you know, your buddy James Rollins, his last book, uh, The Devil Colony, he yeah. blew up the physics building at BYU in his book. <laughs> I, I read it. I read about all the damage that he did there. And uh, So yeah. I think you need to blow up the physics building at the U of U. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't quite figured out what kind of damage we'll do out there, but there'll certainly be a good chunk of the book that will, will take place, uh, some in Salt Lake City and some outside, uh, uh, you know, headed uh, – you know, out into the into the far reaches, of the you know, beyond the, the metropolitan area. Oh, you know what? That's where the beauty comes. I'm going to tell you the most stunning gorges and canyons and mountains. You you're going to have so much material you won't know what to do with yourself. We'll, we'll be there. We're going to check it out. Yeah. Okay. Well, you have managed to creatively combine, as you and I are talking about, your love of history with your passion for writing in this foundation, would you advise other successful artists to combine their passions to create a way of giving back that is unique to them? Sure, and that's what most of them do. Everyone finds uh, some way that they can uh, do something to kind of give back, and it's something, it has to interest you as well, you know, because you, you put a lot of you in it, so it has to be very personal to you, and you can't, you can't do something that's not you because it won't be real, and plus you'll get tired of it very quickly. But I, I love history, so it's very simple for me to, to, to deal with historic preservation. I enjoy it. When we go to a History Matters event, they always take me around. They show me exactly what we're working on. I get to see it. I get to experience it. They explain the problems. We get to really get involved with it so we can see exactly what it was. With the Lincoln Log Cabin, we, we spent an afternoon there, 
and they took us all around, showed us everything, and pointed out in all the details. So you got to find something that interests you, and most of the uh, a lot of writers that I know all uh, do that. Yeah, I, I think I, I agree with you. Um, you know, for anything from bullying to, to for me, literacy is my passion, and and I do uh, literacy workshops. I, you know, that kind of thing, and so that's what drives me. But history—that was my minor in college, actually, and so you have taken history and and have written a number of New York Times best-selling books that are historical thrillers. Let's call them. And let's talk about the book you have out right now, uh, The Jefferson Key. Now, I read it. I read it beginning to end in one sitting. I was up very, very, very late because I couldn't put it down. Yeah. (laughs) Here's the thing I like about it, and, and this is bringing in the historical aspect again. You use Article 1, Section 8, which is a very interesting clause, of the U.S. Constitution. Why don't you tell my listeners what is in Article 1, Section 8 that drives this entire book? It's a fascinating clause. It was put there by the framers. It was put there on purpose, and it was ratified, and it's been sitting in the Constitution since its very beginning. It's called the Letters of Mark, and it gives Congress the power to grant Letters of Mark. And Letters of Mark are an authority from the Congress to a ship owner to become a privateer on behalf of the United States government, which means you can steal, plunder, kill, you can do anything you want to the enemies of this country, and you will be immune from prosecution. And so we actually have the power in our Constitution to hire pirates to work for the United States government. And I dare say very few Americans know that that power is in our Constitution, but it is there. And it was put there on purpose because privateering was a very big deal at the time that the Founding Fathers wrote the Constitution. In fact, the privateers helped win the American Revolution, so they were very cognizant of that, and they wanted to keep that power. Steve, why don't you tell the listeners what's the difference between a privateer and a pirate is? The only difference is the privateer holds the letter of mark. The privateer (laughs) has the letter of mark, which means they're completely immune from prosecution. There's a quote in the book that's from uh, a very popular book on pirates, that says that privateering is the, I mean, uh, uh, privateering is the nursery of pirates, and that's exactly right. Uh, most of them either began as privateers and became pirates, or pirates became became privateers, one or the other. But there's no difference between a pir- privateer and a pirate, except one holds a letter of mark and one does not. And privateers generally worked for governments. Uh, Sir Francis Drake was a very famous one. Where for Queen Elizabeth I and help pillage Spanish shipping. Um, and so it's it's a power that's been used for a very, very long time, and we have it in our Constitution. I noticed it in law school. I remembered it when I was plotting that thriller to bring Cotton Malone home for his first domestic adventure. I decided to use it, and it, I think it turned out real well. I mean, it's a really pretty interesting uh, uh, adventure dealing with the Constitution. It's more than interesting, Steve. <laughs> it, it is utterly fascinating. It, and in fact, as you, you clearly did a lot of research on pirates and the way they do each other in, because there were a couple of scenes I was reading and I was just cringing. Yeah, those, uh, those tortures are all real. I, uh, I have three in the book, and they're, they're real. They were used, actually. And I, there was a couple of them I just I couldn't resist. I mean, when I read about them, and I said, that's, that's too cool i gotta use that i mean it's just it's got to be in the book and i so, bet i can guess <laughs> yeah yeah uh the, and it doesn't give anything away is you know the woodling one the one with woodling that's the one that killed yeah. me oh yeah, my the gosh one, the one with woodling is pretty interesting and that's real and they really did that and when i read an account of that actually happening i said no nah, I, I gotta use that that's just that's too that is so gruesome <laughs> and so awful it is but but it uh but it's real it actually happened you know, I, I this this kind of goes off the topic here, but I am stunned at the the inhumane and vicious ways people come up with of doing each other in. I mean, for crying out loud, what person one day said, "Hey, let's try this," and we'll call it woodling. <laughs> it's pretty amazing that they do it, and we won't give anything away to tell the no, readers. No, we won't. You know, woodling is just two pieces of wood, and they have sticks. They have a a, piece, a strip of leather tied to uh, each end, and two people hold the sticks, and they place a person's head between the two strips.
strips of leather. Then they start twisting the sticks until it tightens around the head, and then they keep twisting, and they keep twisting, and they keep twisting until the skull bursts. And you're right. Who would have actually thought about that? How yes. do we, you know, let's get two sticks. Let's put this together. Let's twist someone's head to their skull burst. Yeah. It's, yeah. You know, it's it, it. Whoever thought of it was quite imaginative. It's a horrible. And demented. Way to, <laughs> but what happens is you don't really die from it. What happens is the pressure on the skull forces your eyeballs out. Oh my! And your, and your eyeballs actually blow out of their sockets because see your eyeballs are just floating in there is all they are they the pressure inside your skull forces them out and you really don't die from it you just sort of bleed to death it's a horrible way to go yeah oh steve <laughs> and you, you described and, it very well in the book too by the way <laughs> yeah and, it's, and as i said it's real and so you know i wanted to use you know real things and so i found three things that 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 pirates actually use not the walk the game plank they almost never did that that's hollywood uh but but woodling was something they did use quite often yes well i don't think they could show woodling on a movie <laughs> no it would be pretty horrible pretty, pretty horrible but it's that's part of writing a novel by the way you want to uh you want to tantalize the reader's senses you know a novelist's job is to use the senses as much as humanly possible in my workshops for history matters i teach this that that you can never overuse the senses ever. You can, you know, you can just don't even hesitate. Use as many of those as you can. And something like woodling that you can feel and touch and cringe, you get the reader's attention, and that's the novelist's job. Well, you got my attention. Job well done. <laughs> okay. Well, let's talk basically about the book. Um, the basis is four United States presidents have been assassinated in 1865, 1881, 1901, and 1963. Each murder is seemingly unrelated and separated by time. But what if those presidents were all killed for the same reason? A clause in the United States Constitution, which we have just been talking about, contained within Article 1, Section 8, which would shock Americans. So, tell us about the Jefferson Key. Uh, the, I mean, you and I just went into the gross part, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, be yeah. careful here, because I would give away some, some plots. I'll be careful here. I'll just say that I, I researched the four, four American assassinations that actually happened. And then there was the one that's in the prologue of the book of Andrew Jackson, which was the first attempt on a president's life that actually ha happened in January 1835. And I put that in the prologue. And I noticed when I was studying the four assassinations, the incredible similarities between them. There's an enormous amount of similarities between them. So it's very, very interesting. And as I began to see all those, I found a way to link them up. Now that I have to be careful because I don't want to give away the book. But there is a, a way that, to link them up. And it was very interesting. So the readers are going to get a, pr a full appreciation of the four assassinations that occurred in our history. Uh, and they do tie into this clause in the Constitution. And and, and all come together. And I wanted an American thriller here. Cotton Malone is usually overseas in Europe. He's in Asia. He is. He's in China. He's always there. He's never come home for an adventure. And this was his sixth. And so I wanted this to be his first domestic adventure. So this is a quintessential domestic American adventure. Deals with the Constitution. Deals with American president assassinations. American pirates. A code from Thomas Jefferson that's real that wasn't broken until about four years ago when modern computers finally broke it. And it's a real code, and I use that in there. And then a mystery concocted by Andrew Jackson. That's my invention, but it's still a pretty cool one because it's not beyond the realm of possibility. Well, and, and I want you to explain that, Steve, for people who, who not only love to read but those who love to write. Explain how something, um, if you're going to create like you did the co uh, the um, the conspiracy that, that Andrew Jackson came up with in your book. Explain how you do that and make it believable. Well, that's the tr trick about writing the kinds of books that I write because my books deal with, with real things. And 90% of what's in my novels is true and accurate, and I keep it true and accurate. There's 10% where I trip it up because I'm writing a novel and I'm there to entertain you, so I have to trip it up a little bit. So I find a way to trip it up in such a way that it's 
hopefully seamless where you're reading it and you go, well, I'm gone. Is that real or not? I don't know if that is. And you won't know if it's real till you get to the end and the writer's note that's in the back of the book because I put one there on purpose to tell you what's real and what's not. And so you will get, you know, when you're done, you can figure out, you can see what, what I did trip up. But the trick is to find something that just makes enough sense. And in this book, there was. There was something because they, as I said, someone tried to kill Andrew Jackson in January 1835, the first time someone had ever tried to kill a president. And that tied in very nicely. And all I had to do was trip up the motivation of that just a little bit uh, to make it fit. Well, hey, it worked. It absolutely worked. I I love uh, the reader's notes at the end where I get to see what was true and what wasn't. Yeah. And, and, and being a student of history myself and specifically American history, I remembered and, and recognized most of it. When you got to that, I'm like, I don't remember that. <laughs> and yeah. so when I got done with the book, I immediately popped open the end. I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. He made it up. <laughs> and please, uh, the, the readers need to understand. I got a nasty email from a lady once who just cussed me out from no end for having the re- writer's note in the book because she said it gave away the whole novel. Of course, I was curious to, as to why she read it first. We put it, <laughs> we put it in the back of the book. Do not read the writer's note until you're done because it right. will spoil the entire book for you. All the surprises will be given away because the writer's note is designed to be read when you're done and you're familiar with everything and you can see what's real and what's not. And most of the time, readers are shocked because they thought something was fake, and it wasn't. It was actually real, because I try to keep it as accurate as I possibly can. Yeah, but you you weave it into a, an astounding story. We need to take a quick break, about two minutes, and we'll be back on the other side, Steve, okay? All right, no problem. 